The 6.5 is on the road at Dell Technologies World 2024 here in Las Vegas. We are analysts, we love Las Vegas, and tech trade shows love Las Vegas too. It's been an awesome event so far, and surprise, it's all been about AI. AI infrastructure, AI PCs with the new Copilot Plus PCs, AI software and AI services. Some great stuff happened up on stage today. A lot of partners, uh, Michael was great, just talking you know, ServiceNow, Samsung, and of course, NVIDIA with Jensen. Yeah, it was a big morning, but it's been a big event so far. And if you kind of walk the halls, I always can get this feeling for the events. When you walk, you kind of look at the audience, you look at the attendees, you look at the energy of the employees, and Dell feels very rejuvenated. The AI pivot right now has seen a big acceleration in terms of market perception, market value, enterprise value, customer adoption, and, and now they've got a whole new set of solutions. And you can see all the things they've been talking to culminating in a go-to-market strategy that we as analysts have to recognize. And so I give a lot of credit. I think it's, it's come a long way. And here's the most interesting thing. We sat down with Michael Dell. He actually said something about this. It's still, I don't know, pregame. It's still the first inning. We're on the third tee. You know, we're in the first half, first quarter. Whatever sports analogy you want to use, it's early. Yeah, and the other thing that Michael talked about was the power of the ecosystem. And I can't imagine a better person to talk about the AI ecosystem related to Dell than Matt Baker. Matt, great to see you, buddy. It's great to be here. I think we might be at batting practice. Oh, I like that. I like I think that. So we got a. This is gonna. This is a decade plus long ride that we're on. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, we saw how long it took took to build out the internet. I think it's going to be even quicker, and I also think that unlike the internet that had the dark fiber and the boom and, and the bust, the benefits that we're, both of our companies are seeing with enterprises and the true benefits and the paybacks they're getting off of this Absolutely. are very, I'm not Babe Ruthing at this point, but it's very compelling, right? When Super you, compelling. When you can have a company talk about how they uh, decreased uh, content creation costs by 50%, yeah. we're talking about hundreds and millions of dollars for certain companies and uh, making customer service better. Yeah. That, could be, that could be just getting rid of one analyst. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Maybe your analyst, come on. Anyway, no, I totally agree. I mean, look, we are seeing the power of technology meeting business. Absolutely. And we always said that, you know, people don't buy technology for technology's sake, they buy it for business sake. This is one of those sort of shifts that you maybe only see once in your life, and you know that those of us that have come up, you're a little older, but those of us that have come up over many, many years have seen, all, I know, you've seen these technological- He's about to call me a boomer, <laughs> just, just wait. Uh, I would never do that. These technological trends, I don't think we've seen one that's been quite as powerful and quite as condensed. So you said 10 years, I think we are early. I think it's hard to imagine where this is going, Matt, but it's going really, really fast. It's going really, I, I think you, you picked it apart really correctly, which is we have seen moments that have been this powerful. I'm not sure we've seen things moving at this velocity. The internet took time. And this is, that's the closest lived experience that I can think of that this is like. But it's moving at a much faster pace. And you know, I think I've heard Michael say it before, is every successive wave of innovation seems to be accelerating and accelerating. It's not happening. It's like a shorter half-life. Totally. Well, hopefully it's not a half-life, but you well, get what well, I'm saying. Well, and it makes sense because we have newer technology working on newer technology, and you have that compounding of that. So it, it, it makes sense, but we also have the ecosystem in place to, I think, enable these types of, uh, of innovations yeah. as well. And by the way, I just meant in between the disruptions. Oh yeah, I, I was like, yeah, no, no, no. I actually, when I, I thought was like, about I don't that, want I, was to, like, I don't want us to disappear like, into darn nothingness. Dark fiber, baby. <laughs> Dark fiber. I'm only seventy percent sure that that'll be the case. Um, listen, you know, partnerships have been a big focus here at Dell Technologies World. Pat pointed out, you know, on stage, some yeah. of the biggest and most prolific CEOs on the planet, basically yeah. coming together, bringing it left to right. How are you encapsulating sort of Dell's partnership strategy? Well, I think that it's really important in the early stages of these big industry movements is you see innovation everywhere. And so you want to maximally partner with a broad ecosystem. So we're partnering not just with the big, largest established companies, but we're also looking to find the smaller upstarts and helping. If you look at any 
AI solution today, it's made up of scores of open source projects, small companies, in addition to being integrated by companies like ourselves or NVIDIA or together, we're pulling it all together. And you know, before we started the, the discussion, you had mentioned finding those patterns. And so you know, we talked about the AI factory. Within that AI factory, and instantiation of it, I should say, is a whole host of smaller, larger partners that cross between ourselves, NVIDIA, and, and others. So it's really important to really, I think, cultivate a broad ecosystem early in these waves because you can't discount away the great right. innovation of a given company. There are going to be many, many unicorns born out of this. Um, and you know, some, some will stay around, some will, you know, won't. But it's important for us to pull all of those together and help our customers not have to deal with all of that integration work. We can, we can help sh you know, share the load collectively. I can imagine how challenging it is though uh, in partnering because you could partner with an infinite number of people. You can. You go too shallow. You need to pick the partners that you can go deep with that can get you to where you and your customers uh, need to go. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be unwieldy, but that's why I think partnerships and ecosystems are a little bit different, right? Like partnership is a one-to-one -one relationship. I think of an ecosystem as a dense vector of partnerships, right? It's like we all can share the load differently and we're pulling different elements of it together, right? So NVIDIA is working with, you know, tuning with PyTorch and other elements right. and we're, Look, we've got this great partnership. Never would have thought we'd been partnering with Meta, but they've built something that is, you know, can really power amazing innovation. And it's once you use that model, that's your model. It's yours to innovate with freely. Uh, and there are other examples like Mistral and others. But yeah, I mean, I think it's building the ecosystem. There are a finite number of people you can have a relationship with, but when you build it into a ecosystem, it can become much more scalable because you're sharing the load across many, many folks. Yeah, Meta's interesting. I mean, you know, 70 billion parameter, Llama, then Llama 2. Uh, there was a lot of initial talk about these gigantic models, but it seems like there's been a whole lot of other talk about, I like to call them SLIMs, other people call them SLMs, but yeah. even vertical yeah. models that address areas like healthcare. Yeah. Um, legal uh, industry and so on and so on. Uh, what are what are you seeing out there? Well, I think we're starting to see the world move away from the my model's bigger than your model, right? Like that's just not really serving anyone, especially you know in the consumer context. If I'm trying to do a project on Mesopotamia, awesome, right? right? But if I'm trying to put a AI system to work. It needs to be infused with my knowledge, yeah. my data. Wait, are you telling me you know you don't want a, a model that's trained on Reddit doing your healthcare chatbot? <laughs> what could go Precisely. wrong? What could what go could wrong, possibly Matt? Possibly go wrong. No, but it, I think it's important not just to, <laughs> not just to to sort of to make light of it, but like if you have a model that's infused with a bunch of superfluous knowledge, it's just burning electrons processing through that. Slim the model way down. Right. Combine it with your data, and this is where. Again, you talked about what are the patterns. The pattern of the last year and probably going forward for some time is augmented generation of some type. Today, RAG is dominant, but yeah. we see agent augmented generation coming down the road. So those use model, uh, I should say, use LLMs in a very specific way, right? You combine knowledge using you know, uh, semantic search, graph search, other techniques, to retrieve information, package it up into a prompt, and dispatch it to an LLM saying, summarize this or turn it into a, you know, stepwise instructions or whatever. So the large language model is working with other AI types, which we might, I hate to say traditional AI. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But every great enterprise use case we see today is a amalgam of traditional, I hate, I can't, I need to come up with something else, but AI in the before times, before machine November. Machine learning. Yeah, machine learning, all of this stuff combined or together. Or analytical-based AI. Yeah, 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 exactly. So 
combining that together, that's what we are seeing, and we're seeing right. a great amount of success with models, you know, in the low billions or even below. And you mentioned healthcare. We've had a great partnership with Dr. Mazi at Northwestern Medicine, and he's developed quite a modest size model. It's about, I think, less than 300 million parameters. Million, not billion, 300 million. And he's using that to analyze and summarize the results of chest x-rays. And he's reducing the cognitive load on radiologists. I mean, think about it, after the pandemic, doctors have been under sure. fire, right? And it's not getting any easier on the other side. So taking any of the cognitive load down is great for doctors. And think about it, going to the hospital is not a walk in the park. It's in fact, it's the opposite. It's super stressful and scary. And if I can get you your results faster, it's a better patient outcome. And it's a hospital. The cost of operating the hospital goes down because it's more efficient. That is a great example of a built-to-purpose model um, that has been trained on, or fine-tuned, I should say, on very, very high-quality data that's leading to great results and is, you know, again, super modestly yeah. sized. We had, uh, we had the chance to talk to Feinberg at Northwestern this morning. Um, oh, great. Along with John Siegel. Yeah, we had a nice conversation over in the broadcast uh, uh, booth. And, you know, it was very interesting to hear these real world. And by the way, one thing you didn't even mention on top of all that by going to smaller models is power. And I mean, there's a huge, you know, I mean, there's a huge, you know, sort of conflicting uh, yeah. situation that's growing because as AI becomes more performant, it's also creating tons of stress on the grid. And it's... Yeah. You know, so it's growing. sort of like, why go there in a C5 Galaxy monster plane when you could take a moped? Exactly. Take the moped. Yeah, no, I mean, it's of course, way more sustainable. it goes back to kind of when we talked about cloud traditionally, you know, right workload, right play, like we're That's right. this is happening again. And I think people, the, you're, it's a, I'm glad you bring that up because I think people have a real world counter case of, well, was cloud easier, cheaper? It was maybe faster back in the day, but sure. now not so much. So with that fresh in your mind, you're like, why am I paying on a per token basis when actually in those rag, Workflows, 90 plus percent of the work is the pipeline. The, the, you know, the inferencing at the end with the LLM, small part of it. So it's like, if I built all this, why don't I just run that? Right. Like, it's trivial. Well, we'll give you a chance to actually talk about where that runs in a minute. I did want to, um, you know, because we have a few minutes left, a couple questions I know that I want to ask. Maybe Pat Please. has another one. But like, I've been listening to your sort of customer zero stories all day. Uh -huh. It seems to me like one of the things Dell's really you know, talking about here at Dell, uh, Dell Tech World is your own AI story. Talk a little bit more about that, about yeah. how you're sort of really customer zero and how much of a focus that Well, is. and that's the great part about this new job of mine is, is that I'm not just working on what we're putting out into the market to help our customers, but I'm helping drive the internal programs. And we're working across, I, I mean, at, at some point, no surface will be untouched, but initially we focused on four areas around driving sales productivity, driving developer productivity, improving customer experience with services by, by adding more, and then you mentioned it, content. Content's an obvious one. Um, you know, so those were the first four areas. We also needed a place to run it, so we have our own internal platform um, that we run it on. Since then, we've grown it out to add our supply chain. And interestingly, in supply chain, it's not a lot of generative um, use cases. It's actually a lot of um, machine learning at scale. So think of it as you know, lots of forecasts and simulations all coming together to, in essence, create a digital twin of our supply chain so that we can you know, push in a weather event here or push in a supply constraint there to understand how the whole system reacts and better optimize the whole versus optimizing the points. So it's across those areas, supply chain, finance, um, and online. I'm really excited about the potential to rethink how customers interact with their commerce experience. Sure. And frankly, you know, we you heard on stage about you know, the AI PC and the role of the PC. I'm excited about how we're gonna just completely change the way that we interact with the digital world. Imagine machine vision, speech recognition, generative AI, like it's, you know, clickety-clackety, you know, 
it, it's it's going to lead to a whole different kids, world. Matt? I, I want because I, I have a book I don't have any little kids. Moo. Oh. Oh, what, clickety-clackety? Yeah, clickety-clackety. It was a book I used to read my kids. Oh, there you go. My kids are all up and out. I can't relate. Oh, but hey, uh, we're real quick, this speed <laughs> round question. I'm speed round question. Gen X. I think you're, you might be. Are you a Gen X? I'm a Gen X. Of course I am. There we I go, am. buddy. Millennial. <laughs> Millennial? I lost my hair when I was like nine. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. <laughs> I love this. It was the stress, right. man. Get back on top. Matt, speed round question here. I mean, listen, the public cloud is 15 years old. 75% of the data is still on-prem or on the enterprise edge. I think it's more than that. This actually. notion of private clouds, uh, these stacks are about five, five years old. Mm -hmm. We still see public clouds. You know, revenue is just, you know, going crazy. And there are AI workloads in this. Where is the best place to run an AI workload? Well, I think, you know, we've stated very clearly that the world's hybrid. I'm not going to say that the public cloud doesn't have a role to play, but I do think that the conditions are different. The computational intensity is such that executing that same cloud model and making it profitable by oversubscribing it gets real difficult when you're consuming lots of computers. I, I, I just think that the logic is the data's on premises. This is all fueled by data, and data has gravity. It's hard to move, it's expensive to move. Why not move the, the compute side of it, which is much lighter weight? Think about the size of even a 70 billion parameter model is still just a few you know, tens of gigs, right? So it's easier to move the, move model, the model to the AI and execute it, and all of the tools to do it are there. I mean. People are trying to separate the concept of cloud and AI as there's something fundamentally different, but, but they're not. Do you need a bare metal Kubernetes cloud to do it? Yeah, that's probably the most effective way of doing it, but all of that orchestration to deploy a generative AI or AI workload exists. This is another class of workloads that has a different makeup of compute storage networking than what came before it. And I think the conditions, based on what I said, and the intensity of the, of the computation is it's gonna follow the data, which means a lot of it's gonna occur on-prem. I also think that the promise of the cloud, that it was going to be significantly more cost-effective, that didn't play out, and so people are like, well, you tried to sell me on that before, so let me find Four a balance. Months. And it's, then you, you said it before, it's, it's all about the right workload in the right place. If there's a reason for it to be in a certain place, right. Edge, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna do your inferencing where the activity's happening because you can't do real-time operations over vast distance, right? It's like there is this thing called, you know, the speed of light, and it's fast, but it's not as fast as you think. Sure. Yeah. Well, listen, I really appreciate you kind of breaking that down, Matt, and just that you spent the time here with us. We know how of busy course. Dell Technologies World can be for any executive, and with the mandate you have now. I expect to see you running around, maybe a little gassed by the end of the week. But uh, I'm gassed for... already. It's day one. <laughs> I won't tell anybody. Just just everybody out there. It's you know it's like it's our little secret. Yeah. Let's have you back soon. Yeah, I'd love it. It's it's awesome. All right, all right. Thanks everyone for tuning in to this episode of the Six Five. We are here in Las Vegas at Dell Technologies World 2024. Join us for all of our coverage. Subscribe and become part of our community. We would appreciate that very much. But for this episode. We got to say goodbye. See you all soon.